Hello, I'm Sarah Pate, co-manager of the Washington Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress. I work at the Washington State Library and my co-manager, Linda Johns, is at the Seattle Public Library. The Centers for the Book help carry out the mission of the National Center, which is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. We also promote our state's literary heritage by putting a focus on books and authors with a connection to our states. Every year, as part of our participation in the Library of Congress National Book Festival, we each choose a book with a local connection. This is part of the Great Reads from Great Places initiative. You can learn more at read.gov. Today, we are speaking with Great Reads authors from several states. They were invited by the affiliate centers for the book from California, Nevada, Rhode Island, Virginia, Washington, and Wisconsin. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's authors to you alphabetically by the name of the state they are representing today. So representing California, Land of the Cranes. Aida Salazar is an award-winning author, arts activist, and translator whose writings for adults and children explore issues of identity and social justice. She is the author of the critically acclaimed middle grade verse novels, The Moon Within and Land of the Cranes, winner of the California Library Association Beatty Award. Aida is a founding member of Las Musas, a Latinx kidlit debut author collective. Her story, By the Light of the Moon, was adapted into a ballet production by the Sonoma Conservatory of Dance and is the first Chicana-themed ballet in history. She lives with her family of artists in a teal house in Oakland, California. Representing Nevada, closer to nowhere. Ellen Hopkins is a poet, former journalist, and the award-winning author of 20 nonfiction books for young readers, 14 best-selling young adult novels, and four novels for adult readers. This is her second middle grade novel. Ellen lives with her extended family, two brilliant German shepherds, and a couple of pawns, not pounds, of koi in the eastern shadow of the northern Nevada Sierra. Representing Rhode Island, Layla's Happiness. Mariah Dessa Ikeri Tali is the author of the award-winning children's book, Layla's Happiness. The poetry collections, Strut and Karma's Footsteps and Dear Continuum, Letters to a Poet Crafting Liberation. She is a native of Queens, New York, living in the lovely state of Rhode Island, where she is currently a PhD student in the theater arts and performance studies program at Brown University. Mariah Dessa is the mother of three galaxies who look like daughters. Representing Virginia, your mama. Nonika Ramos is an educator who wrote the Disturbed Girls Dictionary, a Yalsa Best Fiction for Young Adults selection and an In the Margins Award top 10 pick. Her debut picture book, Your Mama, earned three starred reviews. She's a proud member of Las Musas Book Collective, the Soaring 20s debut group and PB debut troupe 21. She lives in Virginia with her family. Representing Washington, the sea in winter, Christine Day, Upper Skagit, grew up in Seattle, nestled between the sea, the mountains, and the pages of her favorite books. She's the author of I Can Make This Promise, The Sea in Winter, and She Persisted, Maria Tallchief, an early reader biography in the new series inspired by Chelsea Clinton's best-selling picture book. She was born and raised in Washington State and continues to live there with her husband and her daughter. And finally, representing Wisconsin, 10 Ways to Hear Snow. Kathy Camper is the award-winning author of Low Riders in Space, graphic novel series, 10 Ways to Hear Snow, Bugs Before Time, and the forthcoming Low Riders to the Rescue and Arab Arab All Year Round coming in 2022. She also writes zines and is a founding member of the Portland Women of Color Zine Collective. An Arab American born in Madison, Wisconsin, Kathy is a librarian and currently lives in Portland, Oregon. So thank you all so much for your beautiful work and for being uh, here with us today to speak about it. To start today's conversation, we've asked you all to think about the theme of this year's festival, Open a Book, Open the World, and what that means to you. What book opened the world to you? How do your books open worlds for your readers? Um, so let's hear from each of our authors, uh, starting with Kathy. Well, I was thinking about this and I wanted to, um, I realized when I was little, it wasn't even a specific book, but it was that my mom took us to the library and that meant piling three little kids in a red wagon and walking over a mile to, to get come home with a stack of picture books. But that rotating stack of books opened my world. It was um, books that we wouldn't have had on our shelves 
but but they lived with me through life and they led to not me not only being a writer but a librarian too thank you aida well for me it was um in the fifth grade i i received a book by my teacher which i still have and it's right here and it's super old and it says this book belongs to aida still <laughs> and it's um where the sidewalk ends where by shell silverstein and this book has been read so many times and it's my first book of poetry and my my first book i ever owned and and I adore it. So this book opened up the world of poetry to me. It opened up um, the possibility of play and and imagination in 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 the, in the world and in expression. So and that's my relationship to to writing and into and to reading. That's how I come to um, to language and literature. And so I think that's the power of being able to open a book and and kind of. Um, explore, play, travel. And um, so I'm grateful to Mr. Clark. Shout out Mr. Clark, wherever you are. Thank you. Um, Ellen? Um, as, this is my mom also, by the way. She, but she read to us when we were little. And she, like, I think I was the first five-year-old that could quote Dickens. So for me, it was, it was Dickens. It was Great Expectations. It was it was um, going to England, it was, and then it was just the adventures, you know, the, the old classics, Treasure Island and, and Moby Dick and those, you know, high seas adventures that said, hey, you know what? Even a girl can get on a boat and go somewhere sometime. Um, and then later, cause my mom really did let us read whatever we wanted. It was books like um, Shogun and Thornbirds and, and these great, romantic adventures that allowed me as a teenager to go to Japan and to go to New Zealand and Australia and to, just to understand that and by the way I grew up in California that there was a place besides California somewhere out there for me and so yeah it was but I give my mom credit for that as well. Thank you. Nonika? So my mind went to so many places with this question and I thought about what it meant for me as a child um, growing up with a situation where there was absolutely no representation of Latinx families or queer families of any kind. And also um, kind of thinking about the fact that there, the representation that would have existed was so flawed and deeply stereotyped. So I would never see a single father like mine shown in media or shown in books or in any way in a positive light. So when I thought of this question, I thought of him going to work two, three days, sometimes in a row as a lab technologist, sometimes not sleeping, but always having a book tucked under his arm. And it was always a giant book from Bar wrapped in a wrinkled Barnes and Noble bag. And he was always sort of finding that time to read his sci-fi, you know, to read his fantasy, to, re to read The Wizard of Earthsea is one book that came to my mind. And kind of that was um, normal for me and many, many other kids growing up in the Bronx. But that's not something you would have seen represented that we were all seeing our parents working maybe two, three, four shifts, but still having those books, still having the art um, in, in their lives. So I think that that's what started me on my journey of understanding that the world was bigger than what was being presented to me. Thank you. Uh, Christine? My mind also kind of went all over the place trying to figure out how to respond to this question because I think that for a lot of us who appear on panels like this, we are asked some variation of it. It's something that people love to talk about is where did your love of reading come from and what do books really mean to you? And it's such a big all encompassing part of my life and part of my identity as a reader and as a writer that it is actually um, a little ironically, really hard to put into words. <laughs> and so um, for me, I ended up thinking a lot about the mirrors and windows that we often compare books to because it can be such a powerful experience to see parts of yourself reflected on the page and to encounter a character who thinks or feels in ways that really resonate with you, but also to meet characters whose life experiences and whose settings and surroundings are so different from yours 
that it does transport you to another place, whether it's a more fantastical world or the state of Arizona for someone like me who grew up in Washington. Um, so for me, yeah, I just think that through reading and through sharing books and through talking about our favorite books, the opportunities are really limitless and um, that is very exciting. And so, yeah. Thank you. Mariah Dessa? Yes. Um, wow, so much richness already. I think about this question and it's funny. I felt very much like Nonika initially. I thought, uh, I wrote the word closed down, right? Because I would look in the books that I had and there were a lot of fairy tales, right? So Snow White, Cinderella, right? these things where I didn't see myself. I didn't see myself reflected in any way, right? No mirror. And so it's strange that I ended up still, I really loved reading and I really loved writing. And so I think for me, I used to just write myself into a lot of things. But for me, the first book that like blew open the doors that I can remember was a book that I got in high school from a counselor at Talent Search Double Discovery Center at Columbia University. Big up to Jonathan, wherever he is, right? Le very much like Aida. And Jonathan said, I think you should read this because I was reading a lot of Stephen King and R.L. Stein. And he was like, oh, you should check this out. And I'm like, what is this? And it was the autobiography of Malcolm X. And so the autobiography of Malcolm X was a life changer for me, right? It gave me context for why I felt the ways that I felt about myself, gave me context for why I sometimes didn't see myself in certain spaces. And it really helped me to move forward with a sense of pride in who I was and what my identity was, right? It gave me an identity before enslavement so it was super powerful, right? Total game changer. And I would say the other book that really helped me in terms of opening a world was The Alchemist. <laughs> that came later, but The Alchemist was just, that was mind blowing in another way, right? Like it just opened this whole world to me, like the universe is conspiring to bring me these wishes of writing and connecting with readers. Whoa, right? So just so many worlds did open to me through books, but it's important to have someone who helps to guide you to the books that could open the world instead of closing it towards you. Thank you. Um, can each of you tell us a bit about what led you to this story? And um, can we start with Nonika? So I, I, I want to um, answer that question, but also kind of start off with where we left, which is lens. So the other thing I thought about with opening up books and opening up worlds, it's so important, the lens that that comes through and firsthand accounts. So when I'm looking around this space, Mariah Dessa and Christine and Kathy Aida and Ellen and us, we're providing a particular lens that's so important to kids and we're opening up doors. And I can't understand Aida's world without listening to Aida's story specifically from her. And so why is this important? I think it's important to think about the words that have been used in the past, which is humanizing people, humanizing marginalized people, which I'm gonna start there, but also um, pivot to what we really want, which is to get beyond humanizing human beings and get beyond empathy, but to move to the point of connection. And so what we're all talking about is connection connection with the human family, connection with who we are as siblings in this planet is what I think of of opening doors. And so when, you know, I, I have your mommy here and I talk a little bit about the fact that I grew up in a single parent household, but that wasn't just my household. That was the household of many people in my family. And that was the household of many children in my school. And when you're looking at those kids, whenever they were seeing single parent families, par parents remarrying, um, they were seeing a very limited perspective of that, uh, basically where the page was stuck on trauma or the page was stuck on issues, ABC after school special issue. Kids couldn't turn the page past that to see healing or to see pure joy or just the sequel of joy. And so to me, there certainly was struggle growing up in a house. And I'm sure many of us can understand that whether it was in our own lives or lives of people we loved, you know, when you have families transitioning, 
families changing their situations. But I do want to say that when I wrote Your Mama, I was starting off with the joy and I was starting off with what, what it's really all about, which is wealth of family, wealth of community and wealth of bond between caregiver and child. So I wanted to kind of start the sequel of the story we've been hearing over and over and over so that every kid can look and say, that's where I am. I'm not at that. I, this is the point where I am or where I'm going to be because opening doors is opening possibility. Thank you. Does anybody else want to jump in on the, the the theme of our our panel today is family, and um, uh, that's you know how how uh, books we chose from these particular states came together. Would anybody else like to to speak to that? I'll jump in. Um, for me, uh, my first novel, uh, teen novel, was Crank, and it was um, inspired by my uh, my daughter's journey with addiction and. Um, that was a several decade long thing. She's doing well now, but it took her about two and a half decades to find herself and, and be okay. And in that time period, we adopted, my husband and I adopted her first baby. There were seven children along that journey and we took guardianship of three more. One of them came to us with um, PTSD from early childhood trauma um, and he came pretty damaged. I mean, his behaviors were like very hard to deal with unless you had some kind of understanding of why, like PTSD, when too much comes at him, he would like pull off into a corner and pull up his hoodie or fall onto the floor yelling and screaming. So he got to it, came to us in fourth grade and never could make friends. Like he's a junior in high school now. He's finally, you know, pulled himself through that too. But um, when you're that kid <laughs> in the classroom, nobody wants to be your friend and that kind of reputation follows you and it doesn't matter how you grow, how you heal. Um, for a lot of those kids that saw him just there, they never gave him the second chance. So this book is very much, um, uh, an, I want to honor him. It's not his story, but it's a, a child like him who can't control his behaviors all the time, but he's got a huge heart. He's really bright. He wants to do great things, right? And, um, and so that's what this kid is. And he comes to live with his cousin who is like the kid that's got everything. And so she doesn't want to deal with him either. But over the course of their getting to know each other, learning to love each other, despite their differences, um, it's, that's what the book is. So it's a real tribute to kids who have a hard time, not just to kids who have a hard time dealing with real life, but to the kids who have a hard time dealing with those kids, if that makes any sense to you. So it's really about um, opening your minds, opening your hearts, allowing, hopefully that my readers will look beyond the behaviors into, into what's good about, it. we all have such great parts of us, even despite all our problems. <laughs> I've got a few of those myself, so <laughs> I get it too. But that's how I came to writing this book. Um, and so I, I, I love the characters and I hope my readers will love the characters too. Thank you. Aida? Yeah, well, you know, I came to this book um, a little bit by uh, the muse and and a little bit by what what we were experiencing as a community. I'm formerly undocumented. I came here as a as a, an infant and grew up undocumented until I was about 13, 12 or 13 years old. So essentially my whole childhood. And um, and I grew up very in tune with this idea of not belonging, of of being um, uh, illegal, which was the term that was used very readily back then. Mojada or what, whatever it was, and um, and and so my community is a community of, of 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 documented and undocumented folks in the United States, and and when the Trump administration came into power, they started coming after sanctuary states, and so California, being a sanctuary state, was was one of them, and I live in the in the Bay Area, and. Um, there was a, a moment where the mayor of Oakland warned the community that there was that ICE was going to be coming in and raiding, mass raiding, and so the community was terrified. I mean, literally, it was it was terror, and um, and despite 
the mayor's warning, they rounded up 300 people in one day from the street, vending, uh, taking their children to school at their work. So, you know, this was the climate that I was feeling. And because, because this is my community, I, I was very, very impacted by, by this, these actions of terror by the federal government against against undocumented folks and so um so it was in that climate that i i was sitting to write and and do my practice and and i was studying a book about um, the loss of a, a grandparent when my pen wrote deportation and 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 all of a sudden there was a child there it telling me their story and they told me what they liked to eat and how they how what their family was like what their father told them and and the child didn't have a name until um until I, and so I wrote about 30 pages those first 30 pages are almost identical to what you see in the the story today and um and I went into a a, a performance and they were honoring this activist, a Chicana activist named Betita Martinez. And Betita, that name and that power and that spirit of Betita's um, kind of came to life and it just, it just, it, 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 it gelled really easily. And, um, and so this story is about a little girl who is undocumented um, and, and her father gets deported and then she and her mother subsequently end up in a detention center. And, it's, and she writes picture poems to, to express what she's feeling and what she's seeing inside detention. And, and it's an act of resistance for her to speak out, at least in any way that she can, um, uh, against the the brutality and the inhumanity of incarcerating children and families for a misdemeanor offense, so that's where that came from. And I'm, I, you know, I love Betita. Uh, Betita Martinez, the, the uh, actually passed away just um, a, a few a month ago or something. And and um, you know, this this book is dedicated in, in part to her. Thank you, uh, Mariah Dessa. Ah, so in 2005, I had my first daughter and I was looking around for books that reflected our family, right? Very strange kind of family, artists, dreamers, right? And I wasn't finding those books. And so I decided to start writing them because I already wrote poetry. So that's what I did. But it wasn't until... I wrote this, 2012 was when I wrote Layla's Happiness, right? So I had like three other Layla stories that I was working on and I would go back and forth in them and I would think this is the story, right? This is gonna be the story. But Layla's Happiness just happened. And I've come to think about it over time. Like I've talked to my publisher about it. You know, you work with a character, you get to know a character, right? It's development and it's process. And so I've said a couple of times, I don't think you'll ever see the other Layla stories because this was the story, right? So it was written in 2012 and then 2015, it went under contract and then didn't come out till 2019. And it, it's, it's just been this whole journey with me and this little girl, right? This little girl who little by little just revealed her family, right? There are other stories where you see other, other things happening, right? Like, I can't say what they are, but there are other things that happen. And so I've seen her go through problems. I've seen her, you know, at her dad's office. Well, his work, it's not an office, but I've seen her there. But this moment where she's just expressing happiness, right? That came as a huge kind of like surprise to me. Um, the book just, it, it was a complete surprise. So. Yeah, I mean, I think Layla just revealed herself over time and that's how she ended up coming to me. Really, really wild, right? To feel like all these voices in your head telling you these stories, right? Strange. Thank you. Um, Christine? So I think that a lot of the stories that I've written so far have come from some combination of my personal experiences 
and also of things that I want to see more in books. So for The Sea in Winter, um, it is about a girl named Maisie, who is a young, very curious ballet student. And she has a knee injury that takes her away from her practice and away from her studio and her friends and her entire life there for several months before the story even begins. And so we sort of pick up the story when she is going through the long, arduous process of healing, both uh, physically and mentally and emotionally. And um, this was partially inspired by some of my own experiences. I also grew up doing ballet. Um, she is a young native girl with different uh, tribal nation affiliations than I have, but I am a young native girl who grew up sort of separate from the community and growing up in the suburbs of Seattle, which is a bit more of like her experience and a bit more of like the experiences of other characters I've written. Um, and so there's all these things that I was drawing inspiration from. Another thing I really wanted to see more in books was happy blended families, because um, I think that when I was growing up, I remember reading all of these books where like the step parents are just evil or they are the source of a lot of strife and conflict in books very often. And um, I wanted a different interpretation of that because the people I know in my life who become step parents or step into that role for a young child um, are always seem to be just doing their best. And I think that it can be a really special and beautiful relationship between someone who meets this parent that comes into their life when they are a kid rather than when they are just born themselves. I think that's such a beautiful thing. And so I really wanted to show this blended family where the main character never directly calls her stepfather, her stepfather or her little brother, her half brother, that those labels are just sort of, they don't even exist in the book. You won't actually find them written out in that particular text anywhere, even though it's very explicit that that's the relationship. Um, so those were some of the things that I sort of grew from, and it was a really, uh, really uh, quite the amazing process going through and writing this book, kind of as Mariah Dessa just said, you know, letting the characters sort of reveal themselves to you over time. And it was a very different type of ex writing experience for me because this was my first book that was actually under contract before I had started writing it because I was lucky enough my first book sold in a two book deal. And so I can make this promise with Pitch to My Publisher, they picked it up with the promise of two books because they wanted to show that they were very serious about me and growing my career. And that was amazing. But then when I actually uh, finished, I can make this promise and turn it into my editor. And then I had to start over from the very beginning on a, on a whole new book and I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do yet. And there were all these people who had believed in me so much. And I really cared about my agent and my editor and my whole team. And it was suddenly very um, intimidating and scary to come up with something that I would love as much and that they would love as much. And I was also going through this really weird funk after I turned in, I can make this promise where it was such a loss for me which was not how I expected to feel after turning in my first book that I had worked so hard on. And after I had achieved this dream of getting published that I had been pursuing basically my entire adulthood. <laughs> and so um, I was grappling with all of those, really this weird uh, mix of emotions where so many things in my life seemed to be going right. And I should have been really happy, but I was also just sad sometimes and couldn't really shake that sadness or that sense of I that's a book I'm never going to work on again or this is a book that I just need to come up with and have it be amazing <laughs> and so it was a really um interesting cathartic process for me and it became even more so actually when I signed on to write She Persisted Maria Tall Chief 
for this new series based on Chelsea Clinton's best-selling picture book um, because that was this story about this Native American ballerina who was the first prima ballerina in America. And she was the first American to travel to Europe and to dance on some of the world's biggest stages, the Paris Opera Ballet. She was the first American to perform there. And same thing with the Bolshoi Theater in Russia. And she was this native woman who came from Oklahoma and just worked so hard and was so amazing. And so to work on those two stories, this kind of quieter story of a girl who is grappling with this injury and with her family and just with her own mixed emotions about being in middle school and not seeing her friends and kind of going through this particular moment in her life versus writing the life story of this woman who achieved so much and lived so large and was just an inspiration for so many people for so many reasons was a really uh, kind of fascinating duality to hold. And so, yeah, that is where The Sea and Winter came from. And it's a book that um, I'm really proud of. I think that my craft grew a lot through the process of writing it. And I hope that people love the blended family and how I chose to resolve everything with her ballet lessons and her injury, because um, it is more of what I wanted to see in books. So there we go. Thank you. Um, Kathy. So um, when I, Ten Ways to Hear Snow is one of those books that took maybe decades because I started it and it was like a poem and I had this idea and it just kind of was always in my notebooks and I kept working on it. But um, one of the things, one of the advantages I had as working as a librarian for many years was seeing a vast amount of books. So um, I could look at not just like one book or a few books that had come out, but we, we could pull together like 200 books on certain topics. So some of the things I started noticing, especially when we started talking about how we need diverse books, was that there was more than people missing, there was also locations. And one of the things that started making me really mad was that I wasn't seeing non-white people in locations where they lived. It was usually in New York. And like I work at a big West Coast library and um, the picture books about black people on the West Coast were zilch. Uh, so for my own representation as an Arab American, most of the books I would see were in the desert with camels. And my experience growing up was in the Midwest with snow. And I thought that that's something that I wanna start showing. Where are those stories in the Midwest, the South, the um, the states that aren't all centered around New York. And what's interesting to me is that that's a subconscious bias of publishing being centered in New York to always think that New York is the most diverse place and that's where all our stories occur. So that was one thing that I worked hard to show. And I, I even had to talk to the illustrator and editor because the, the first sketches look like it was on an East Coast neighborhood. And I said, Dearborn, Michigan is the biggest representation of Arabs, show us. Another thing that I fought for is to show old people in, um, in assisted living and in nursing homes, because I think our fear of aging and our stereotypes, we're still showing grandparents down on the farm or living happily in an extended family when my reality, I, uh, the past couple of years, I have visited so many relatives and friends uh, sorting through assisted living or nursing homes, but also not having that be horrible, seeing joyous and fun things. So when my little girl, um, Lena, goes to make grape leaves with her grandma, she goes to an assisted living facility. And um, that was something I just wanted to give visibility to. And the last thing I wanted to shout out is that, um, as some, some other authors here have mentioned, the past four years have been horrendous um, with, with Trump. And um, we know how both Latinx people and Muslims were immediately persecuted. But that, that led to, when I look at Arab books, many of them are explaining the Muslim religion. And that's great, and it's necessary 
under that kind of situation, but tons of us aren't Muslim and we're not religious. And also I wanted books that just didn't talk about religion, just showed us doing stuff and, and living our lives. So um, in, in my book, it's just not stated what, what religion the family is. And I think if you were um, Muslim or Christian or not particularly religious, the story still works. So I, I wanted to do a shout out for a lot of these other things that are connected to, to who we are, our ethnicities, but also where we are and, and how we live. Because I think that um, th those stories need to change and be more visible. Thank you so much. It's kind of a good segue into um, our next question, which is, how does your book relate to your state? Um, so let's start with Nonika. And, and as usual, I'm going to pivot a little bit <laughs> because I don't follow directions very well. But I'm really inspired so much of what I'm hearing from Kathy and, and everyone. You know, I, there have been too many times in my life when I have had to send my white spouse into spaces to be treated with respect. And when you were talking, that's where my brain went. Um, and when I, when I know that if I'm going to go, I'm gonna have a very different response and it's extremely painful. And so I wanted to go to some of the illustrations for a second because Jackie Alcantara, the illustrator of Your Mama portrayed uh, a person, a woman who could be construed as single or maybe she's queer, we don't know. She's tattooed, okay, she's darker brown youthful, she dresses very fashionably. And, and it's funny because why are these things relevant? <clears throat> because oftentimes the person that I do see depicted so gorgeously and so respectfully on these pages is the person who has trouble being treated with respect in schools, is the person who has trouble walking into a store and not having someone trail them to see if they're shoplifting is, is me in some ways. And, it, and I think of myself as somebody who has a master's of fine arts and a master's of education, 15 years of teaching experience, and I will still be treated like trash when I walk into certain spaces um, by the way I'm yelled at, the way I'm, uh, um, people make assumptions. And I'm an empowered person because I have resources now, but I think about all of the people, all of the parents, all of the single parents, all of the marginalized brown and especially darker parents, black parents who don't have what I now have and what I've worked for, they don't have it. And so when I look at your mama, I think that mama is the mama that I wanted to receive and respect and adore and talk about self-care because the mama in these pages has a day. If you turn to the middle of the book, it says sometimes your mama is cray cray because after this year, especially, but always for women of color and in particular for black women. I'm representing Latinx women, but I do wanna to speak to the fact that it is always harder with colorism in our society. Okay. Um, we have not honored these women. We've rendered them invisible when they are the most vital potent forces in their communities. And so when I think about Virginia and I think about how this book represents my state, I think about how it honors mothers and mother figures, how it smashes the patriarchy. Your mama's so sweet, she could be a bakery. Your mama's so woke, does she stand by and watch injustice? Nope. These are the women that I'm honoring and these are the women I'm putting forth when I'm honoring my state. And I'm honoring the caregivers because as I've said before, you know, my mama was my father, my mama was my madrina, my mama was my tias, my mama was my babysitter. That was a community and oftentimes we have to kind of put front and center the idea that daddies are mamas. We have to think more about what, how we construe gender roles even. And so for me, I see a man when I see this cover oftentimes, my papi with a mustache <laughs> is who I see on these, on these pages. So when I think about Virginia, I think about the mothers in the homes who were virtual schooling and working and writing books and taking care of their children, their, their, all the children, foster children, adopted children, biological children, what, the children, the mamas who are homeschooling, the mamas who are doing all these things with their kids at home and then cleaning the schools, making the schools sanitary for our children to now go. So mothering through their brooms, mothering through their cleaning. You know, I'm thinking of the moms who are doing all these things. They're marching, they're cooking, they're reading to their kids at night. 
And I also want to say that doesn't mean that I'm saying that mother figures have to be superhuman. Quite the contrary. In one of the pages, there's a mom taking her kids to the library. I was thinking about all of you as I was talking about that, bringing piles of books into the kids, you know, making that time. Those are heroic acts. To be able to take time out of all of those responsibilities, to do it out of love, to do it out of empowering these children, these next generations, you know, that is the true heroism. It's not about saying we can't take a breath, we can't take time, we can't have a day. It was so important to me in representing these mothers and in talking about the state of saying self-care, mental health is so important. If we can't take care of ourselves, then we can't mother. We can't mother our families. We can't mother our communities. We can't mother this nation. Right now, when I'm listening to everyone talk, Mariah Dessa, Christine, Kathy, Aida, Ellen, we're mothering this nation. It's not just isolated to ourselves. So that's what I think about when I think about honoring the caregivers in my state. Thank you so much. Um, Ellen. Oops, you're, you're still muted, Ellen. Let's see. I hit wrong buttons all the time, sorry. Um, so for me, I mean, I've lived in the West forever and I, I think actually this book, uh, out of all my books, which many of them are set in Nevada, this one is set in California, but it's it's I'm sort of like what No Nika was saying, it's, it's, um, it's representative of the West. I mean, there's, it's distance to go anywhere. It's what you see when you look at the mountains. It's um, that the ocean is over there. So it paints a landscape um, of the West. And I think the funny thing is like when you live in Nevada and you travel, and by the way, not Nevada, even though I know that's the correct, Nevada is what we should say. Here, if, if you say Nevada, they're like, you ain't from around here, are ya? <laughs> you? Know? Um, so it's, they, it's Nevada here. Um, but Nevada is when you go and travel and you say, you let people know that it snows in Nevada. They're like, what? It snows in Nevada? Because everybody that doesn't live in Nevada or in California thinks Nevada is Las Vegas. And it's not Las Vegas. <laughs> There's so much to it that's not. It's it's mountains and did in fact Nevada is no, now I've got Nevada um, is the most mountainous state in in the country and people probably don't know that but it's the most um, north south mountain ranges like so if you go east to west you're doing this the whole time <laughs> people think it's all desert and it's not so it's painting landscapes it's also again. Um, opening up the idea of communities that don't look like what people think they look like necessarily. You know, it's not, it's not all gambling in Nevada. We have, we ski, we have rivers, we do all these wonderful recreational things that people don't realize that you can do here. But, um, but I agree that it, the book really addresses a university, a versa, universi universality. I guess that's the right word, right? Um, and humanness and humanity, that um, the, the thing that I think that we were missing, we we're all talking about the last four years or five or however many it was, but um, what we've lost a lot of is the idea of how we're alike as humans. And I think that's what we're, we're really starting to miss now. And, and it's one thing that I do think books can Fix. You know, if we can come back to like how we're alike, no matter what we look like, no matter where we live, there are ways that we're all alike. And the main way is we all want to love and we all want to be loved, right? And so that is something that that the guy that lives over there with his sign or his truck horn blaring or whatever kind of forgets that, you know, we all want the same things. Um, the basic stuff. And so if we can come back to that and books are the one way I think that we can get there is because we, we open up minds and we open up hearts through our characters um, having their minds and hearts open as well. So that's what I hope this book will do and what all these lovely books will do, um, whether they're picture books or they're novels. And by the way, I just want to give a shout out to all the poets that are here, because what, really? <laughs> Yay for poets and poetry. Thank you. Aida? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you know, this, 
I was raised in California and um, uh, Kathy mentioned how, um, how there's this kind of divide and, and, and the, the world is not only, not only, you know, exclusively we have this white canon that we've, we've seen in publishing, but also it's very, um, you know, regional. And so, so my stories, majority of my stories take place in California. And this one is especially um, rooted in California because, um, because we have 16 million Latine people in, living in California. We're the largest ethnic group in California. We outnumber white people in the state. And if you were to look at Hollywood, that's never represented in either on screen or behind the screen. If you look at publishing, that's never represented. And if you look at the nation as a whole, there are three states where uh, school aged children outnumber, Latine school aged children outnumber any ethnicity. And so you, you are, are, are a racial group. And so it's really, um, a, 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 you know, a tragedy that we don't see more rep representation. So Cal this book is about an undocumented family that is so typical in this, in this, in this state in California. And there are 2 million undocumented families and, and people in, in, in the state of California. And so it represents a reality. And, and that's, and, and, or, or like me, I used to be undocumented. I'm no longer, um, but, but that was my life growing up. And, and of course, I was never in a detention center, though, you know, the, the, the United States and, and Mexico border at California has been like a, a huge wound in, in the history of migration in this country. And I wanted to point to that. I wanted us to, to, to kind of be really clear that, that, you know, the migration of peoples in the Americas has happened before the conquest. And, and this book, because it's about, about this mythical homeland called Aslan, which is, you know, some, as some people say it was in the Southwest. Aslan means land of the cranes. And the prophecy said that the Aztecs would descend from this area and move down to found their great nation in the center of the universe, which is Tenochtitlan, modern day Mexico City. But the prophecy said that one day they would come back to their homeland, to the land of the cranes. And so that's what this book is about. We're back in the land of the cranes. We are, it is, it is like every, species who who migrates for their well-being and for their their safety and for abundance um that's what people need to do and we i think as a as a, a society and as humans as a human family as nonica said that we we have to be able to have compassionate policies have you know um different solutions for the people who are the victims of, you know, U.S. imperialism and and global warming and you know and violence and and persecution in their home countries, so because we can, and there's no reason why we can, we shouldn't, um, and I think we have a moral obligation to to do so. So this book is dedicated to all the working, um, documented, formally undocumented. Um, folks in California and all of the Latine folks from which we descend, right? That history of who we are um, comes from, from that history of, of migration. And, um, and so California is, is, is there in, in its heart and soul. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? Well, I talked a little bit about um, how I wanted to show an Arab family in the Midwest. So 10 Ways to Hear Snow is about a little girl named Lena who wakes up and it's snowed. And it, of course, the big snow has changed everything. And it's grape leaf day when she was going to go make grape leaves with her grandma. And her grandma's losing her eyesight and is in assisted living. So Lena walks through the, the, the remainders of the snowstorm. And instead of looking, she thinks about how to hear the snow. And growing up in the Midwest, 
snow always to me was amazing with that first big snow because it could shut everything down and it was like an immediate holiday like maybe you didn't have to go to school people were struggling to get to work but as a kid it, it was kind of fantastic and I also have really good memories of doing things like everybody would get together and help push a car out or um, go go have um, go sliding in the parks or, or these kind of um, it, it was like a holiday but it was unpredictable and it was it was uh, put on people people didn't control it and um, so one of the things I really liked in writing this book was was sort of um, sinking deep in nature and thinking about the sounds of snow and and what it's like when it snows and we often connect snow with holidays like Christmas, but I didn't. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep it just. It could be this a snowstorm in March or a snowstorm in November. Um, but I. I also really, really love nature, and I think um, that it's a restorative thing that people are losing. So I. It was important to me to have a girl in the snow with these sensory perceptions without adults leading her. So I know now many kids never get to go walk even a few blocks by themselves, but it was really important to me to have her do that accomplishment, but also to show a child relating to nature and, and that wonder and restorative feeling. And I, I guess I should just add that 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 that's I grew up in Wisconsin and, and I'm so touched to have this as a representative book because I, I don't know that people even know that there's Arabs living in Wisconsin, but um, it, it was so much a part of, of my childhood because winter lasted from October to probably April, <laughs> so we got plenty of snow. Thank you. Christine? Kathy, I love what you just said about the restorative power of nature, because that's definitely something that I had in mind when I was writing The Sea in Winter as well. Um, as I had mentioned before, this is very much a story about a young Native dancer who is injured and healing. And some of that comes from her family and sort of reconnecting with them during this midwinter road trip they take. Um, from They start from their home in Seattle and go to the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State and around to their sort of, to her family's kind of tribal territories, their ancestral homelands, which are closer to the ocean. Um, specifically, her mother is from the Macaw Nation and her stepfather is from the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe. And um, so, yeah, I, I really wanted to get some of those sensory details of Pacific Northwest in February, a time when a lot of people don't travel here because it's so rainy and because it's so cold and because it's just not the time when people go to beaches. Although I wanted to show them going to beaches and digging for clams and kind of doing some of these things that Native folks have been doing here since time immemorial. And I wanted to show just how powerful and restorative those scenes and those moments are. And I wanted to be really specific with the geography and with the types of, you know, flora and fauna that would surround them and the specific mountain ranges that are at their backs the whole time. And with the Pacific Ocean and how it rushes up to the shore and greets them. All of those different things. And, um, yeah, I also really wanted to emphasize all of this from a contemporary Native perspective, because when I was growing up, and I know that kids still learn a lot about Lewis and Clark and their, their journey west and what that looks like in the curriculum and in the textbooks and in how people talk about westward movement in this country. And it's this sort of romantic, idea of these hardy white settlers moving across and making it all the way to the very western edge of this continent which was so wild and beautiful and basically ready to uh, manifest destiny 
right? Um, and I think that um, there was actually some kind of a couple of stories worked into the scene which I wanted to acknowledge about uh, Chief Seattle and the Duwamish people actually welcoming the Denny party when they first made, made it to uh, the Seattle area and how they literally kept them alive by feeding them clams and showing them how to uh, live off of the land here because they arrived in the middle of winter and their women who had babies were so malnourished, they were not producing milk to feed their children. And so if it weren't for them and their generosity, uh, those you know, settlers wouldn't have actually survived. And so that was, I want to introduce some of that sort of history. And I also want to show, because it is so often left out, just how deep and rich the histories were here before any of that even happened. So the places that they go to, like they stay in a motel in Port Angeles and um, Port Angeles is actually the site of this really historic El Clallam village that archeological digs have, you know, unearthed uh, basically, you know, relics of their civilization that date back as far back as ancient Rome. That is how deep the histories are here and how a lot of these paths and trails that people take to go west were there from, you know, indigenous trading routes. And a lot of these movements already sort of existed and there was such thriving communities. And then there was also a lot of hardships and tragedies too with, you know, mudslides that took out entire villages. And, um, all sorts of things that happened, all of these really uh, fascinating things. And so for me, I wanted to really honor Washington State by showing what a vibrant, beautiful, diverse, thriving place it is now, because I love the Pacific Northwest so much. And because I do think it's really wonderful that people from all walks of life come here and that for a lot of people, this is sort of a sanctuary state um, for undocumented folks, for refugees from other places, for, again, all backgrounds. I think that it's important to recognize that this is a home for all those people, but that it also is a home for Native folks who might not have, you know, we might not be recognized in the same sort of way our histories and um, it is true that, you know, there are only about 1% of Native kids in most uh, urban and suburban schools and stuff like that, but they are still here. We are still here, and our histories and our perspectives still matter very much, and our nation-to-nation -nation relationships are still very relevant and important. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccines were distributed here to our tribal folks first. Uh, you know, my family was able, we were invited to go and get vaccinated before the state was able to uh, vaccinate people in my age group. And all around here, you know, the Quinault Nation was vaccinating educators and people who wouldn't, within their county and within their region, because they had an excess of vaccines and they wanted to vaccinate as many people as possible. And so, yeah, to me, I just wanted to show the Native nations that are here because they are also diverse. And just so all of that is like a kaleidoscope in its complexity. But I, and I'm sure I only got a little glimmer of it in this book. But um, yeah, it is really an honor to be chosen to represent Washington State because I love this place so much and it means so much to me. And, um, yeah, I can't imagine living anywhere else, so. Thank you. Uh, Mariah Dessa? Yes, I thank you for leaving me for last. I really do, because this is a tough one. And Kate from the Rhode Island Center for the Book, and you all know why, right? I'm new in Rhode Island. I've only been living in Rhode Island for like, what, two or three years. And so when I wrote this book, I was home in New York, right? And so, the Rhode Island Center for the Book's embrace of the book is actually what's allowed me to see the connection between Layla's happiness and Rhode Island. It's such a trip. Like I have spent this entire pandemic time 
doing a couple of things that have brought me joy. And one of them is, of course, going to the beach, right? Rhode Island is the ocean state. And so one of my favorite pages in Layla's Happiness is this one. Shout out to my girl, Ashley Corin. This page where Layla and Juan are at the beach and Layla says that the ocean, right, it reaches into her pocket to give a sand dollar. And every time I get to that page, I feel so much comfort. And that's one of the things that I get from moving around the beaches in Rhode Island, right? I had this experience where I was going to the library on the south side, south side of Providence. And I got out, I was going to read Layla's Happiness to a group of kids, but virtually, right, because of the pandemic. And so there's a page in Layla's Happiness where Layla talks about being able to um, feed chickens, right, give all the trees names. And she talks about the community garden down the block. So literally, when my husband and I got out of the car, there were chickens and roosters right in somebody's yard across the street from the library. And there's a community garden down the block from the Southside Providence Library, right? So you start to see these connections, right? And one of the things that I think I was, before you move here, you don't know who lives here, right? You have no idea. And so coming here, there are all these little Laylas running around. There are all these little black girls, right? Running around here, black Americans, some, but a lot of children from Cape Verde, right? Um, a lot of Dominican children. And so you start to realize like, oh man, there really is a connection. There's a farmer's market where people are going. It's kind of in the city. And you see the children really connecting, connecting with nature, connecting with their communities, connecting with their families. Like one of the things I like about Providence in particular in Rhode Island is that we also have space. We have space and we have quality time with each other which is something that we didn't really have, right, where I was. We were busy doing the grind and the hustle. And so Layla gets to spend a lot of time, like you see her just taking moments, right, taking moments to enjoy chasing her friend Juan and seeing butterflies. And those are things that I have really enjoyed doing since I moved here as well. And so now, right, two years, three years later, right, and also because, again, the Rhode Island Center for the Book chose the book, and I was like, you, what, are you kidding me? Wow, what a huge honor, right? What a huge privilege. I, I'm new here, and y'all are, like, giving so much love to the book. Like, it's just such a huge blessing. And so I started to see the connections more the more I moved around. And I also have to say the people here from day one, just gave the book a lot of love. It was kind of shocking, right? We had a book party and like all my people from here were just buying up the book in multiple copies and like brought the kids and yeah, it's 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 just a huge blessing. So I, I'm I'm really I'm really grateful to Rhode Island Center for the book and Rhode Island for embracing me and Layla and her gifts. So yeah, that's how I think Layla's happiness represents Rhode Island. Big up Providence. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We have already reached an hour. It went by like this for me, um, listening to all of you talk about your brilliant work. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with your states and with the world. And thank you so much for being here and um, giving us some glimpses into your brilliant minds. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Honor, thank you. Thanks. And it was wonderful being here with everyone else too. <laughs>